All right, hey everybody, and welcome to Chew Stream. A little intro for you, because I always forget. All right, hey everybody, and welcome to Chew Stream. And uh, just in the nick of time, my buddy uh, Matt Johnson just arrived. Hey, Matt. Hey, 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 how's it going? Right on, awesome. So, yeah, I was just. Uh, Welcoming everybody back, including yourself, Matt. It's yeah, good to yeah, see it's been a minute. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me just do a little housekeeping here. And uh, first, I want to ask everybody where they're from. That's been a while. I haven't asked where anybody's from in a while. And while you type in wherever you're from, I just want to remind everybody that you caught the live interactive stream, or at least the people that are watching right this second is watching the live interactive stream. And so that means that you can ask questions and we'd be happy to answer your questions. You just have to go to slido.com, hashtag chew stream, and then you could type in your questions. And best thing of all, you don't have to sign up for an account. You can type it in anonymously if you want to, you know, Stay anonymous or whatever. It's all good. It's all good. Or you could put in your name and we'd give you a big shout out and say, hello, this question's from so-and-so. All right. So as I was talking, uh, all these people started answering. And so I want to give a big shout out to Cincinnati, England, Hungary, Bulgaria, Toronto, uh, Eric, Oregon, Minnesota, and France, Quebec, Norway, China, Motor City, France, Brazil, Albania, living in Germany, San Francisco, Burbank, Argentina, Atlanta, Georgia, San Antonio, Costa Rica, Indonesia, Czech, uh, France, Korea, Mexico, holy smokes. All right, I think <laughs> we get the picture here. Everywhere. Yes, Israel, Kansas City. Awesome. Well, it's great to have everybody on the stream. And uh, why don't we get started? Okay, so what you're going to see here is slightly different than the usual. Usually what I do is I take my time painting, you know, because it doesn't matter. When I'm done, I'm going to speed everything up and just going to play it for you from beginning to end and look amazing, <laughs> right? Look like I know exactly what I'm doing. So today, I figure I would kind of pull the artistic pants down, figuratively, of course, <laughs> and show you real time. Real time Bobby. This is what I call it. Wow. All right. So then everybody can feel better about themselves, except for me. And uh, <laughs> except for you. That's good. That's all good. I don't mind at all. You know, so I'm... people can go, oh, yeah, I'm on the right track. Yeah, I feel like it's important to see the the back and forth and, you know, maybe you go down a dead end for a minute and then you change your mind and that's awesome. This is going to be good. Cool. And yeah, let us also know in the chat, like, what do you rather? Speed paintings that are all sped up or keeping it real, slow mm. and painful, like watching, literally watching paint dry. <laughs> I can see the value in both. I can see the value in a speed painting in the sense that I get a really quick overview of the entire thing. But then I think seeing brushstroke by brushstroke, there's a lot of value there too, because like you, for the reason you're doing it today. Absolutely. And there's another reason I'm doing this today, you know, because of the topic that I want to talk about, you know, you're going to see some painting slow, steady hopefully improving you know as mm -hmm. hopefully I, I i'll show a few more of these kind of paintings and then you can paint along with me uh paint your own little study these are all observational sketches and so um what i want to get at here is that learning is not always about painting zombies fighting dragons fighting orcs and all this cool stuff Right, It's not always about that. A lot of times, what you don't see, what people don't post, are these boring ones, so-called boring ones, unless you're into them. 
If you're into them, then this is probably exciting for you and this is probably engaging. So please be into it because these are the fundamentals. All you need to do, if you want to paint along with me, is just take a bunch of stuff or maybe just one object and put it into a corner, put it onto a box or whatever, just so you don't have a background and start painting. And then you can see how quickly you're going as opposed to me and so on and so forth. And then you can, you know, kind of celebrate the day that you destroyed my speed <laughs> and blah, 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 blah. Uh, change, it's a difficult thing. It's something that we should celebrate, right? It's something that we should be proud of, especially how hard it can be and how daunting it could be. So with that, I wanted to go into a little topic for today before we get into the questions. And this allows everybody to you know, start typing in questions into Slido, of course. You can see at the bottom of the uh, screen there, uh, slido.com, hashtag ChooseStream. So today I want to talk about change because... I do remember this huge point in my life when, uh, actually when I started the studio, where I quit all these things all at once, Matt. I don't know if mm -hmm. you know about this, but what I did was I quit um, everything that I felt the least bit addicted to. So that meant coffee. That meant pop, you know, soda pop. Mm. That meant um, I was smoking at the time, so, you know, quitting cigarettes, weed. You did all three of these at Alcohol. All it keeps going. <laughs> it keeps going. Alcohol. Um, I quit. You know, I, I said I quit meat as well. I quit my job. I quit money because I felt like I was addicted to money. Wow. Um, and I forget what else. I, I literally quit everything that I thought I would be the least bit addicted to. Right. And for a lot of people, change is one of those things that's very, 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 very difficult. So I want to talk about kind of like going back and thinking about what were the things, what were the key kind of components to the change? Because it wasn't gradual. It wasn't weaning off of stuff. This was everything at once. That's right? pretty brutal. That's pretty that's a pretty big shift you're making. Absolutely. It was, it was brutal. It was brutal. And I, I got through it. And then afterwards I felt empowered. That was the main thing, Matt, was like, I felt like, okay, if I know I have total control of my life, then this studio idea will make it. Starting a company, I'll make it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a very empowering thing to do. So first thing I needed to realize I need to be objectively aware of the situation. Now, what does this mean? It means like a lot of times from the inside out, you're looking at your situation and you're going, I've done everything possible. I've done everything right, yet life doesn't throw me a bone. Oh, I've been doing this for enough time as well, you know, all this stuff and nothing's happening. Well, that's the first kind of that's a pretty common example of not being objectively aware of our situation. We think we're aware, but we're not totally objective when we are looking at, you know, ourselves. And this happens all the time. This happens to me as well. You know, it could just be like things like somebody's telling you, you have a bad temper. Every time we talk, you start to explode. And then, you know, the other person goes... But it's not me that explodes first. It's you. <laughs> You're the problem. Blah, 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 blah. But then if you recorded it, perhaps, or perhaps if you're caught in that moment and that person goes, hey, I'm cool right now. You see, right now you are going off the edge. I don't want to do that, right? Something like that. So being objectively aware of the situation, it's not an easy thing to do, but it's a super important thing to do. A lot of times this is going to your spouse or, you know, somebody, your best friend and going, I want this. I want the pain of knowing the truth. Please give it to me. And having that support structure kind of in place before you need it is, is, is difficult. It takes time to make sure that these are the right people that are going to keep me from going off the deep end and they need to know there's a code word 
you know, hey, Matt, you're code red again. <laughs> oh, man, I do need to draw more or whatever it is, you know, like those, those that that's like building a support system for getting over addiction in a lot of ways. You know, addiction isn't always uh, drugs. It could be shopping. Right. It could be watching a certain TV show like Game of Thrones or something. Right. Um, yeah. So this social media <laughs> and, you know, we're creatures of habit. What what's a habit? It's kind of an addiction by itself, right? So being effective, objectively aware of the situation. Um, are you trying hard enough? Are you actually doing studies? When you do studies, are you actually studying, or are you just doing the time? Because I've been there, I've done the time, and nothing happened. Okay, so next one here is, this one's a good one. Attach emotional impact. Now, why is this so good? Because if you think about it, emotions is what really causes change. Huge, that's the spark plug, right? That is the, the huge kind of spark, the huge initial energy to start the change, right? If you want to be a great artist, hear me out right now. Wherever you are in your life, in your career, all that stuff, I want you to think about the dream that you would love to dare to think about. And I'm saying it that way because a lot of times as we stumble through life, our dreams, they go down a notch and then they go down another notch and so on and so forth. So what is the dream that you barely even dare to think about or you don't even dare? You know, I talk with a lot of artists, of course, and when I go to, the further I go away from North America, the more kind of laughter when I tell somebody, okay, yeah, your dream is to go to Pixar. Is it to become a, like a director? You want to be a director at Pixar? And then they'll be like, ha, 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 ha. you know, <laughs> because they're, they're like shy. They're like, oh, I can't even, no, I can't even think that, you know, that's, that's too crazy. Uh, I can't even dare to think that. Or when I tell them, don't remember, uh, you know, don't forget me when you become a big art director or whatever, and 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 you know, you could give me a job or whatever. And people <laughs> are like, <laughs> you're so funny, you know. But it happens. It happens. Uh, so the whole entire thing is, if you attach a huge emotional impact to whatever your goal is. So say. Um, you know, your goal is to become whatever, art director at, at Blizzard or something like that. Well, or perhaps create, you know, the top game in the world. Mm -hmm. Let's just imagine that for a second. What's, what's your ultimate artistic goal? Do you have one, Matt? My, my ultimate artistic goal is to write a feature film. Write a feature film? Yeah, specifically write a piece of fiction that gets turned into a feature film or a television series because that's so much more flexible these days. So that'd be fun. Okay, so uh, the times where you're kind of wasting your time the most, okay, the times or the habits that you have where you could totally be working on, you know, your, your feature film, mm -hmm. but you're not. Okay, let's put that image in your head. Where are you? What are you doing? Are you drunk on the floor? Chips all mm -hmm. around you? That kind of thing. I don't know. <laughs> right? But imagine it in your head and you're looking at it from a third person point of view. So you're looking into the room. You see the, you know, obviously I don't think this of you, but like this drunken <laughs> mat on the floor, uh, <laughs> you know, bags of chips all around. Whatever that picture is. Imagine that and you're looking at that person. Uh -huh. I'm saying that person because you want to slowly kind of detach yourself from that person. Uh huh. And then make kind of like um, the animated, you know, Looney Tunes version of that, right? Now you're looking at it. And now it's just a funny cartoon show. Okay. And, and then let's turn to the future now and think about, okay, Matt the person that writes screenplays for feature films. Mm -hmm. Huge. Huge in the industry. 
<laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. You're there, and everybody is kind of crawling on your every word. Anytime you're going to put out a new thing, everybody's on it. Okay, so where are you? Where's there? You're not in that place that you're living in now. Mm -hmm. Where are you living? You know, it, which city is this? What, what surroundings do you have? Breathe it all in because life is awesome. Right? And when you go to events, the paparazzi, everybody, your fans, nonstop, you know, you can hear them before you come out onto the panel. Matt Johnson, Matt Johnson, <laughs> Matt Johnson. I'm liking this story. You know? I like this story a lot. <laughs> you're loving it. You're hearing this. You see the crowd. You come onto stage. Boom! Flashing lights everywhere. Everybody's <laughs> cheering. Everybody's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, how did you get there? Well, Bobby Chu just put me there. That's how. It just happened. <laughs> what yeah, was your no, everyday I, like? Right, you know what I, got I mean? That feeling when you when you brought it up, that I immediately got the feeling you mentioned where I giggled it off. Like I mm -hmm. literally just did that on this conversation. That's crazy. Well, like, get it into is, it. You know, breathe yeah. it in. Let the tears run down your face, <laughs> even of like pure happiness because you've achieved this dream that you barely even dared to dream. You know, you have all of these famous celebrities on your phone calling you. <laughs> Give me a part. Give me a part in your next thing. Well, Samuel, come on, Samuel L. Jackson. Not right yeah. now. I got, you know, <laughs> so-and-so on the other line that kind of thing and really breathe it in, live it up and be happy, be, have a big, huge smile on your face. What you're trying to do is create huge emotional impact because with huge emotional impact, if it's the right kind, all of a sudden you are into art. If it's the wrong kind, all of a sudden you're scared of dogs, you know, uh, different situations bring on different things. Now you could let life try to somehow hopefully give you one of these situations and then you'll be charged up ready to go ready to go after your goals but most likely that's not going to happen so instead let's give ourselves that charging up feeling that energy to really propel yourself you want to be an amazing painter well you are you're an amazing painter and right now is the period where you'll be looking back years later going i remember that time I remember that time where I, I was just starting to get it, just starting to understand what it really takes to become an awesome painter. You know, and you think about it right now, you are that awesome painter. Whatever you do, people love it. People admire it. Uh, you know, like bring it to the nth degree. Don't keep it at this, okay, well, I'm just going to be modest. I'm going to just try to, you know, um, think... I do really good paintings and there's, you know, a bunch of people that like them. That's not, even if that's your goal, it's not enough emotional impact to really change neuro, neurological pathways. You know, like with huge emotions, you can change yourself physiologically. It happens all the time in different cases, cases where somebody's hair just falls out the next day. You know, because they're so stressed. I've actually had a friend that had that happen. Wow. Yeah. Through acupuncture, he actually somehow grew a whole head of hair again. I swear. What I swear on my life. But, uh, you know, and then you have those stories of like a person, their hair just goes white because they got, yeah. got so scared. Right? The key to turning that door open whether it's a good door or a bad door, is emotional, is the emotional impact that you give yourself. So live in that. Breathe it. You know, for like 10 minutes a day, I would do this every day in the shower. So that anytime I took a shower, I would make sure I'm going through this. So it becomes habitual. I took that tip from you to uh, start deciding on certain times of day to think about certain things. And it, it starts becoming automatic. So... Then when you get in the shower, you just don't even think about anything else. You just right away, I start thinking about something I'm writing. Actually, that's my specific one. Yeah. And uh, it works really well. And I also wanted to say, 
um, I think that a lot of people feel like that point that like this isn't the same for everyone and it is it is the same like we all go through that struggle period of like i don't know if i'm going to be successful at this and then if you the, consistently keep at it that's when you do have that five-year moment where you look back and you're like oh man i can't believe where i was five years ago versus today but it, it is it's it's something that's hard to see while you're in it i appreciate you pointing that out because i feel like an oscar-winning screenwriter right now and that I have so many things I need to go do, you know, because thank I you for staying on up. the stream, Matt. <laughs> yeah, I have to catch up. <laughs> yeah. Well, right after yeah. this, you know, go into a future you and start That's writing, right. start writing. Yeah. It's inspiring. Next one. All right. Next one is replace old rewards with new ones. Now, what I mean by this is, you know, I would smoke a cigarette because it gave me a certain reward before. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's a good reward or bad. And pretty much right after the cigarette, it was like this shitty feeling. Mm -hmm. Like I did not like it. I was like, ah, oh, man, I just smoked another cigarette. So the whole entire thing is to replace old rewards with new ones. Now, going back to my example of quitting like all those different things. What was, you know, I had a lot of old kind of rewards to, uh, to fill, right? Cause mm -hmm. coffee, meat, you know, uh, so now I don't get any, as much satisfaction from food even. <laughs> you don't have caffeine, you don't have protein. Like yeah. all these things are. Cigarettes, calories. alcohol, everything. Uh, I had to work out tremendously until I was like about to throw up. I think one oh, time wow. I actually did throw up. But it was because uh, I needed that much intensity. I needed that, that much of this, you know, new feeling. Instead of um, taking a walk. You know, I take a walk, go a few blocks, come back home. <laughs> Will it get rid of all of those things that I don't have in my life anymore? No, it didn't. I needed to cripple myself really in a healthy way. So I just exercised like mad to the point where I was just almost like delirious, almost high, you know, from wow. exercising, right? But that happens and you hear about that happening and you feel great. It's this wonderful natural high where you're just like, just so happy because you did it. Right. And it, it, it becomes more and more, uh, you become, you kind of change your addiction to that thing, right? Like um, when I'm exercising and I'm dieting and I have like my diet week where I have a pretty strict diet that I stick to and then I have a cheat day on Saturday and I eat whatever I want to on Saturday, right? I feel a little bit like when you smoke a cigarette, you know, it's like, oh man, did I really? And you start to crave being in the diet mode more than the craving mode and the same is true of creating when you're creating regularly and you're getting small amounts of that positive reinforcement from doing the thing you start to crave that thing instead right absolutely totally you can find the same kind of um equivalent in learning right like mm, say you learn true. say you only do like maybe an hour of learning a week well, get rid of your whatever habits that you want to change, whatever old stuff that you want to change and replace it with uh, learning until your eyes are about to bleed, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not to that point. But, uh, you know, for a couple hours every day, every day instead of every week, and then go through just commit to doing 10 days of that, 10 days of that, and I guarantee you, you're going to come out of that not regretting it at all. If you are able to allocate a bunch of time to just learning for two hours a day, after 10 days, you're going to be glowing. You're going to be doing mm -hmm. awesome. And then you're going to feel this new kind of feeling and then hopefully be addicted to that. Right? Absolutely. All right. So next one here. Oh, and by the way, I do... I got to mention this since we're talking about learning and because every year 
there's always people that ask right after the sale, <laughs> hey, can I still get the sale? I just, you know, I just missed it. So please, 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 I implore you, if you are interested in learning anything about art, if you want a really great opportunity here, the Schoolism subscriptions, what that means is, and this is something that everybody asks, if I get one Schoolism subscription, does that mean I can only access one class or all the classes? You can access every single class with just one subscription. We're trying to make education as affordable as possible and the top education. So with a Schoolism account, regularly, it's $298 for an entire year of learning. Right now, you get $100 off of that $298. So that means you can learn for an entire year, unlimited, switching, learning every single class for $200, under $200. So don't miss out. I, you know, every year there's tons of people that miss it. So tell your friends as well because this, you know, it doesn't happen for that long. And uh, when it's over, it's over. Also, I did want to mention this wonderful little story. And it's this email. Unfortunately, I was trying to dig up this email. And uh, a few years ago, I deleted all of my old emails. Mm. So I don't have this email anymore. But if you have an awesome kind of story of success from schoolism and everything, I would love to hear it. You just email it to info at schoolism.com. Tell us your story. And uh, I'd love to even talk about it on the stream if that's okay. That's a great idea. So this is a cool one, Matt. I'm sure you don't know this one. Um, so I had this email from this guy in Sri Lanka years ago when we were first starting the Schoolism subscriptions. And he was saying, or after a couple years, and he was saying... Um, that he always told, he has three sons. One's 11, one's 14, one's 16. And he's always told them all their lives that they weren't gonna go to school. And he goes, it's because I'm a bus driver in Sri Lanka and I don't make a lot of money. It's like, okay. And hmm. he said, but they love art. They love art. And uh, one day they told me, you know, there's this thing, schoolism they have a subscription. Can you please give us a subscription? We'll all share it. Mm. Right, and that time it was the sale. So he went to the bank and got a loan because he had to get an actual loan for $200. Wow. Actually, I'm sorry, it wasn't even the sale. It was a loan for $300. We didn't have the sale yet. Anyways, he got the money. He paid for the subscription. His, his three little sons got to work on, you know, got to learn on schoolism and all this stuff. And uh, I guess because they were told all their lives they couldn't have something. When <laughs> it was finally like, okay, the doors have opened, the floodgates have opened, and you can learn all you want. Imagine how much they gobbled up these classes. Oh, man. They oh, man. literally devoured these classes. It was all, it was their whole lives, right? For and a you're year. Not, and you're not even, not, not binge watching them either. I'm sure they were like really getting in there. Together as a team. Yeah. That's right? Awesome. And so he wrote and he's like, yeah, I had to get a loan for the subscriptions, but I want to tell you this is now year two of the school zone subscriptions and this year they paid for it themselves and are actually helping the family out because they're actually getting these little art jobs and things like that and making money from the skills wow. that they learned. How Whoa. cool is that? Whoa. <laughs> One year. That is of course I'm um, I'm surprised. I could only imagine how much art kind of engulfed their lives you know, mm. to get that good that fast. Um, and man, it sucks that I lost that email. But if you're out there, if you wrote that email to me or if you're one of the sons, 
you know, uh, write back to me because I would love to hear a continuation. And if you guys uh, also have a story out there and you're listening, just send it to info at schoolism.com. I'd love to share some of these success stories. It helps to kind of empower all of us to be motivated and such. Absolutely. I think that one year, I, mean, I can only imagine if it's now five years later or 10 years later. Uh, how long ago was that email? This must have been, yeah, around five years, yeah, I would think. Yeah. Uh, that would be an awesome update to get. Totally, right? So um, I'm going super slow with these. Let me continue on. Next one, number four, make new actions easy to do and vice versa on the bad stuff. You know, make the bad things they don't want to do less accessible. So for you, Matt, you want to, you know, uh, screenwriting, always mm -hmm. have that screenwriting program on. Every time, you know, before you go to sleep or whatever, if you don't turn off your computer, just put that thing on, right? Have your notepad right beside you or whatever. Put all mm -hmm. the other distractions that you might have. Put those away. You know, put those away and put them in very inaccessible places. That's a great idea because even uh, small things like, uh, reading a book, you know, I think reading is important. Of course, reading is important, but, um, do I need to read a Stephen King book every night for 45 minutes before I go to bed when I've already read 15 of those, or do I need to work on my book for 45 minutes, right? Or my screenplay, either one. So, um, yeah, it's easy to find those little distractions for sure. Right on. Uh, next one last one journal now i'm not the journal kind of person matt hmm. and really for me it's not even journaling it's me sticking a little sticker onto my calendar like i did it okay journaling is great because then you can and i do have a really crappy journal matt where i i write in it very very uh seldom but they're spurts, right? Okay. Uh, and it's nice to go back into those times and check out uh, not just what you wrote, but how many times did you write? So that's like the whole entire calendar thing, right? Every time you mm -hmm. do that thing, put a little sticker. You know, and, and if you do this right, if you have a few lines, a few weeks of stickers, it's going to be way harder for you not to want to do that thing again so you can put mm. on another sticker. Yeah, because now you've built something, this wall of green dots, and now it would be the action you'd be taking would be to be ruining your wall or otherwise taking away from your wall by not doing it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's psychology. That's great psychology for sure. And that's that's what I want to talk about today. So I don't want to you know, I want to make sure we get to the questions that people okay. have been asking. Yeah. We got a lot of good ones over here. Uh, Great. You want to go ahead now? Um, let's see. The very top one, uh, 10 thumbs up here. And you guys, don't forget, you can go in and upvote questions, even if you don't have one of your own. How important is it for an artist to embrace or overcome self-doubt? What are some ways that you do that in your own artistic practice? Well, that's kind of like the whole entire, you know, dreaming big thing. That I was talking about uh, and but let me add to this I want to always try to add a little bit more info right sure so let me tell you anonymous that um, sometimes it's not actually that important to uh, believe in yourself now that's pretty messed up why did Bobby hmm. say that you know what I mean the most important things is that you go through the actions that one would take if one believed in themselves. Okay, so feel free. I'm going <laughs> to, if the visualizing, you know, doing the successful thing doesn't click with you, because I know there's friends of mine, people I know that are just so kind of quote unquote realistic that uh, they would never believe that. Right. Even if they believed, even if they went through the journey of thinking about it and imagining it, they wouldn't believe it. So instead, I would say to all the pessimists out there, 
that's cool. Just do the steps, do the things that you feel you would need to do if you did believe. And just keep going on that path. Because there are times, I could tell you, I'm a pretty optimistic person. But there are times when, when I was thinking, yeah, that's way too big. I could never do that. And then you end up doing that. You know, like, I never thought I would win, win an Emmy. And not like, like a really, really great Emmy, too. Because it was, <laughs> yeah. it was for creating a TV show that was like the best animated cartoon show for children in 2016. How did that happen? I never would have imagined that. I really wouldn't. Um, but I kept going through the steps, right? We kept going through the steps of what we thought, you know, a successful uh, intellectual property would do from the conception of just an animated comic book app all the way to crossing the line to becoming a TV show to winning an Emmy. That's something else. I mean, it's like people feel like I can't work on a television show until I work on a television show. Yeah. And that's not true. You can do it right now in your living room, right? Or people told me uh, my own, you know, my own educators have taught, told me, yeah, it's not a good idea to start your own studio, mm. you know, right out of school, right out of the gate. You know, I spent 11 months at somebody else's studio uh, working before I quit and started doing my own. Now, yeah, sure, there's a lot of people that don't make it or whatever, but uh, I just kept thinking, okay, I'm just going to keep doing the things that I feel I need to do if I did have, you know, a successful studio. Was I scared? Yes. Did I think I would make it? You know, it's, it's very, I don't even know. I don't even know how I truly felt at that time because half of me was trying to psych myself into it. But then you have this other side where it's, it's a fact, you know, how many companies would last that first five years or whatever? You hear about this, the first one year of a restaurant, what are the chances mm -hmm. of it surviving or whatever? And True. then, uh, yeah, past five years and now it's, you know, 14 years. So anyhow. Well, it's because even then you were doing the things that a 14-year-old company would do. You're, you're, you weren't behaving like a company that was going to go out of business in five years, right? The same way. So you're, you're, all, you're psyching yourself out for that as well. You know, don't, don't act like a company that fails soon. You have to act like a company that lasts, right? Not just a company. And I think a lot of people do that. Like we can just pretend to be a studio for a little while. And instead you need to pretend to be a great studio that is going to win awards and last for a long time. And that's a different thing, I think. Definitely. And, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff, it was like I thought studios should be like this. But then you gain more knowledge, you gain more experience, and you realize, oh, actually, it should be like this. But mm -hmm. the objective was always the same. Let's act like winners. <laughs> you know, <That's> let's, awesome. <laughs> yeah. let's go through the steps that we think if we were winners, this is what we would do. If we were winners, that's funny. That is so smart, though, to, to stay in that mindset. Um, we got another good question here, Green Freak. Thank you, Green Freak. Uh, what are some ways that artists can change the world? That's a big, big sky question. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, well, I feel like I've changed a slice of the world, you know, with schoolism. Mm -hmm. That, you know, the, the email of the uh, bus driver with the kids and the kids start to make money and all this stuff from their art, from schoolism classes. Wow. You know, mm -hmm. now it's not just changing a person's life. It's changing a family's life right and who knows what happens down the road from there second generation artists perhaps you know the ripple who effect knows? Is a, yeah it's crazy yeah and that now hopefully they will be in a position or hopefully they are in a position now where they can help somebody else as well and that's huge 
Um, so number one is teach somebody. That's a, a very easy way to literally change somebody's life. You know, if you come to a point where you have something to share that is really good, share it with somebody else. Um, but also, I feel like the highest levels of art changes the world. The highest, highest levels of art. The second highest level of art uh, creates a huge emotional impact, which most likely, um, you know, could change a few people's lives as well. So, uh, you know, artists that have changed the world, I feel like Yoda, that character, mm. changed the world, uh, especially when it first came out and everything, and mm -hmm. it's talking all this wise stuff. You know, there is no try. You know, there is only do or whatever. It's like, do or do yeah. not. There is no try. That's yeah. on my wall. I have Love it on the it. wall. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then there's people like Banksy. Mm. Change the world. All That's sorts. The things. And these are, you know, these are regular people. Not Yoda, of course, but there's a regular <laughs> person that created Yoda's Yoda. Real. He's out there. Yeah, and as hard as it is to believe, they're regular people with two arms, two legs, most mm -hmm. likely, and a brain, you know, same as us, most likely. Why don't we go on to the next question? Yeah, let's do it. That was a great answer. Let's see. Um, do you think artists should worry about how slow they work? Everyone says, take your time, but I can't imagine a studio wanting to hire a slow worker. Well, the fastest way to get fast and effectively fast is by going slow first. You know, like, uh, look at different disciplines, like uh, martial arts, for example. You gotta mm -hmm. learn the fundamentals of a punch. You're gonna be doing it slowly. You're gonna be doing it very controlled, and then you get better at it, and then you get better at it. And then, you know, if I told you to draw a uh, VW bug, right? Uh, whatever car, it doesn't matter. If I ask you to draw that once, twice, a thousand times, I guarantee you that thousandth drawing, it's going to be way quicker. And if I told you draw it as fast as you can, you'll be able to draw that thing a lightning quick mm -hmm. and with precision, you know, and you'll, you'll start to draw that thing really, really well. There's this very easy to see uh, difference between speed painters that know how to finish stuff versus speed painters that can only speed paint. Interesting. And it's because the people that know how to finish stuff can see all the things that you don't know uh, and we know that you don't know it. Because there's certain marks that you'll put down where it's like, okay, all five of these marks are talking about perspective, and that sixth one is not. That one is wrong. Hmm. Because you can see the intent. Um, you can see blurred out areas where they don't understand elbows or something like that. <laughs> you know, like you can tell. So go slow, understand, paint to understand, and then consciously try to in a controlled way, try to go faster. That's but, a really good tip. I remember uh, you guys, you and Terry, when I was at the in-house workshop, challenging us to paint a sphere as well as we could in two hours, I think it was. And it was just a you know white on white sphere exercise. Paint it as well as you can in two hours. And then it was like, okay, this is great. You could have done this and that a little bit better. Let's do it again and let's do it in one hour. <laughs> it's like, well, if I only did it this way in two hours, there's no way it's going to get better in one hour. But it did. It got exponentially better because you're doing it that second time with that slow first time in your in your mind. And then we did it a third time in a half hour. And the one we did in a half hour was the best of the three because we had taken our time and really thought it through. It's very, very interesting exercise. I challenge anybody out there to try that one. I Yeah, very well said. 
let's go on to the next question. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Do you think character designers need a secondary skill, such as sculpting, environment prop design, to find work? Uh, it seems to be something that Anonymous has been hearing lately. I think even better is that you have a secondary interest. Mm. I feel like that kind of stuff really uh, propels you to another level. Uh, and that's something that's super in common with so many of the best artists out there. So, so, so many. Um, who was I talking with? I think I was talking with Claire Hummel. And she is uh, an art director for characters on video games. And she loves... Um, she loves costumes from a certain period. She loves the pyramids, you know, and, and that really brings her above and beyond most artists because, you know, now there's, there's something really special about her that becomes even more uh, expert level. Like, does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like I do creatures and then obviously if you're going to do a creature in your film, you know, my my name might pop up. You know, it's it's not it's been pretty common uh especially in later years. I do remember a point in the very beginning where I I have this portfolio and has animation in it. It has layouts. Um, you know, it has all sorts of stuff, Matt, because I learned all these things. And so what a waste would it be if I took them off of my, um, you know, website? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that might be a waste if that was the kind of work I was looking for. Uh, but at the same time, I knew that I wanted to get really good at one thing first, whatever that might be, you know, because in the very beginning... It's like there's thousands of you at that level, hundreds of thousands, maybe. How do you get above that? How do you, uh, you know, swim over those, those <laughs> little rapids there uh, and kind of separate yourself from the other school of fish, new fish? You got to become an expert in something. And then when you become an expert in that, Become an expert in another thing, in another thing. And don't try to build them all up at once. Or, yeah, do them one at a time. You'll get way more traction that way. But would you say that the first is the most important? You said uh, be interested in something. Like, that's it, more than, like, being a character designer and going and learning how to sculpt. It's more important to be a character designer who's really into uniforms or really into performance art that kind of thing i think the first step the easiest way to <clears throat> and of course there are many different ways to do things for example marcel vignali he's like you know like wilder's tulp he's they're both like mm -hmm. renaissance artists that do everything sure um but wilder he started off with characters Mm -hmm. Maybe children's book, maybe children's books first, but it was one and then the other and now, you know, character design and now he does like a bunch of stuff. So, cool. yeah, start with that one thing first. Okay, like, that makes a lot of sense. I hear you. Um, let's go to another question. Uh, how do you handle critiques now? Like, for example, how you manage schoolism or your art skills uh, compared when you were younger? How do you handle critiques now compared to when you were younger? I miss them, you know, I really miss them. Uh, but I try to, I try to find these kinds of honest critiques. So for example, uh, Cody Gramstad on schoolism, he teaches Dice Tatsumi and Robert Kondo's course, the Tonko House uh, Painting with Light and Color, which I highly recommend. And actually, this video that you're watching, everybody, these videos are from actually doing the class with Cody Gramstad as my teacher. I thought it looked like that style. That's really cool. Right? It's not how I usually paint. And so what Cody didn't know was that that was me in his class. 
because I had a pseudo name. I had a completely different name, and I was taking his class, and I wanted the critiques. Right, so I I love critiques, and I, I wish that's like the one thing I really miss from the good old days of art forums when they were really thriving, was that people would they wouldn't just pat each other on the back. Mm-hmm. How many likes did you get? People post their stuff to get critiques and try to get better. I think uh, one thing I would love to see come back is when people post. Uh, some something that isn't finished you put WIP work in progress uh, critiques welcomed mm-hmm. you know and just kind yeah. of search for those critiques because nowadays it's like we just want pats on the back and it's just I don't know it doesn't really help that much that's so true if you're only looking at how many people like it then you don't get anything out of that that's very very true yeah so Cool. Um, next question. What are you most excited about with Lightbox Expo? Oh, dang. Oh, dang. So we are, what, like four months out from Lightbox Expo. Oh, it's so soon. It's it's so soon. Oh, my God. <laughs> I am just, I am the most excited about um, this very first one because I feel like the first one is going to be this giant seed of change. Mm. Yep. You know, like... No other time that I know of has so many of like the top, top, top artists in, you know, the major industries of movies, games, uh, animation and illustration come together into one place in such a, an amazing way. Um, so I'm really looking forward to bring together the art community and uh, also exposing them to the rest of the art community because there's so many artists out there that don't know any of these people yet you know we should we absolutely Mm. should know these people you know you're a huge game of thrones fan who did the character designs the costume designs for game of thrones do you know because if you're an artist, especially, you should know. Just the average super fan of Game of Thrones should know this, right. right? There's so many little, tiny, tiny things that they don't even need to know that they still know. Like who left <laughs> the coffee cup in the you know in one scene or whatever. <laughs> right. It's like why why are you filling your brains up with that when you could learn about who the set designer was, who right. the cinematographer was, all that stuff. And if if you just, if you count up just a handful of artists that are coming to Lightbox Expo, you know, maybe like Victoria Ying, for example, mm-hmm. worked on Tangled, Frozen, mm-hmm. Moana. Uh, if you took just a handful of artists and you added up how much each of their projects have made over the years, uh, for that company, for those companies, you would be in the billions, everybody. Easily. Easily into the billions. And for these artists to not be known, I think that's a travesty. And that's something, that's the next big thing that I would like to change. I feel like we deserve uh, uh, the spotlight, you know, as well. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be as big as like Charlize Theron or something like that. But like we deserve a little spotlight and it's coming to a point, right? It is absolutely coming to a point. I was on this, I was on this film. um, I won't say which film. It was a pretty cool film from last year or whatever. And then one of the actors uh, started talking to me. Mm -hmm. And then I realized he has less followers than I do. (laughs) <laughs> right which to me that was kind of cool because that was a sign for me like things are changing yeah for sure you know you have people like Loish who has over 1.5 million followers she That's is crazy. a legitimate celebrity you know she's an internet celebrity or whatever uh, Instagram artist but she's also a high level professional you know, working in video games. Right. Um, you have 
all these different people. Kim jong Gi, he has over a million now. Um, you know, Art Germ, I believe he's over half a million, and so on and so forth. So we are getting to that point, and I just I would love to pour a whole bunch of gasoline on that fire mm -hmm. and like get things moving at a higher pace. And Lightbox becomes part of the story of future projects where someone says, how did you guys start working on this project? And you're like, oh, man, I don't remember. It was three or four years ago. Oh, I know what it was. It was at the first Lightbox. I met him and we had this conversation. And it just becomes part of the narrative for so many things that people are going to create. Absolutely. Well, yeah, and that's that's part of the goal as well. So there's a ton of artists that are coming and you can see them on the site, mm -hmm. lightboxexpo.com, and you got to check it out. But on top of that, there's a ton of artists that are coming that are not on the site because mm. they're just, they're walking around as participants, as attendees. Right. There's a ton of uh, producers, directors, uh, things like that, that are also coming, you know? So that's, that's a huge part of it to create an event where good luck can happen. Awesome. A lot of people, they say I'm lucky in the things that I've done and stuff like that. And perhaps this is for another uh, stream. But I would say, yeah, I am lucky. But I've, I understand luck. And luck is something that you can generate, that you can cultivate, like seeds turning into plants. Not every mm -hmm. seed is going to turn into a plant. But if you plant them right, there will be a bunch that will. Right? That's so true. Do we have uh, some more time for some questions? Let's take one last question. Yeah, one last question. Um, let's see. Are there any plans for Schoolism hosting a business for artists course or a collaboration class where the instructor acts as the director? So I have taught uh, a workshop in Florence this year, mm -hmm. like a couple months ago, on the business of art. Um, I haven't had the time to put together a course but it would be something that I would like to do in the future but don't hold your breath because right now there's a lot of things happening a lot of really great things happening so I've been quite busy uh, but if you can only remember two things from this stream one is the schoolism spring sale is happening right mm -hmm. now <laughs> and the other is check out Lightbox Expo because that, I, I, I swear it's going to be history in the making. It's going to be one of those moments where you don't even realize the importance of it until years later and you can point it to that, that event. It's going to be <laughs> awesome. Can't it's wait. Exciting. Hope to see everybody there. So I guess uh, that's pretty much it for today, Matt. Thank All you right. so much for yeah. joining me. Thank you Absolutely. to everybody in the chat for joining me. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Now, a huge part of the success of this channel and everything that I do is because of you, the listener. So thank you. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel and then press the notification button because that way you'll get instant notification the next time I put out a new video. Thank you very much.